Acts chapter 20. We'll be reading the whole chapter, starting in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopatar, the Berean, the son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them in Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, uh, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and bent over him and talking and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Asos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and went to Medellin, and sailing from there, we came to the following day opposite Chios. The next day, we touched at Samos. The day after that, we went to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia. For he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now, from Miletus, he sent to, Ephes to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none, none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he set, himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. Well, ever gone on a trip uh, for the purpose of seeing what you can see along the way? In 2003, when I was, I was a substitute, I was substitute teaching, Mary was doing what she's still doing, working as an editor through the internet, 
we had sold our house, we put all our stuff in storage, and we went on a trip to Singapore, and we were about to come back to the USA in early July. I didn't have to be, we didn't have to be anywhere in particular until the start of the school year in Tennessee. We had our plane tickets to fly back from Singapore to Seattle, but then decided that instead of buying another set of tickets to get from Seattle to Tennessee, we'd buy a vehicle and enjoy the journey. The price is basically the same. So we found a car dealership online, you know, in Singapore, found it online and, and called them and saying, you know, if you pick us up at the airport and take us to your lot, we'll look into buying something from you. And he did, and we did. We got a red Chevrolet minivan that we basically then lived out of for the next two months, or most of the next two months, as we toured first Washington State and then Oregon and Northern California and Idaho and Montana, and North and South Dakota, seeing every national park we could along the way, the Olympic Mountains, Mount Rainier, Crater Lake, Yellowstone, Mount Rushmore, uh, then East, Shenandoah, closer to here, Washington, D.C., Gettysburg, Williamsburg. We took that van all the way from the Pacific coast to the outer banks of North Carolina. It was an epic journey. When we moved here in 2007, we still had that same red minivan, as though this was its final destination. You're on the way to somewhere. Do you know where it is? Someone said, life is a journey, not a destination. Well, that sounds clever, doesn't it? It's to encourage you to, to stop and smell the roses, and to enjoy the views, enjoy the trip. It sounds clever, but it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think about it. Every journey, by definition, has a destination. You're not just wandering. I don't think if you are, you're in trouble. Journeys are about getting somewhere. Yes, you should enjoy the journey, um, but, you, but you better have a destination. And someone said, life is a journey, and journeys are all about direction. Now, the great thing about that trip was that, sure, we didn't have to be anywhere for like two months. We still had to be somewhere. We still had a final destination, but we could wake up for, you know, for about two months, 1.10 days in a row. We, we did not sleep even in a building, okay? Like you camp right by the, by the minivan or in it. But we, uh, for a while, we could wake up and see where we're going to go today. You know, get us out the map. You know, what is it now? The Redwood Forest, the Crater Lake, or wherever, and we could wander like that. But we eventually had a destination, and even getting to those places along the way, we needed this day before GPS. We needed a map. We needed to know our course. Someone said, life is a journey, not a race. We weren't in a hurry, but we still needed in, in, uh, directions. But whether or, not, whether or not it is a race, it is, has a course. And you better know how to follow it. Up until now in Acts, at least with the story of Paul, the last few chapters, you could get the feeling that he's just kind of wandering. You know, at one point he's like, he want to go into what they call Asia, which is his province in what we now call Turkey. And he said the spirit of the Lord wouldn't allow him to. So he's, the spirit leads him here, leads him there. And he gets a vision at night, go to the Macedonia. And you, you know, he doesn't have a definite plan of every place he wants to go. Or if he does, he's allowing the Lord to override it. You can get the feeling that he's just, there's no pattern, there's no plan, there's no destination. But remember the goal, the course of the book of Acts from chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said, you will receive power. The church received that power at Pentecost. And we now receive it with the Holy Spirit at conversion. And you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, where they are. Judea, the area around. Uh, Samaria, where Philip first got, went. And now to the ends of the earth. Now, Paul won't make it to the ends of the earth by the end of Acts, but he will make it to where the ends of the earth come, to a crossroads of the earth. And that's the trip we're following, is, is from now until the end of Acts. Getting there by the end of this book is the destination. And now in chapter 20, he begins the steps that will get him there, to the crossroads of the end of the earth. And he determines like Jesus before him in the, in the first volume, Luke, to go to Jerusalem. Now from here on, Paul will do some encouraging, some strengthening along the way. But basically his traveling missionary days are over. I don't know whether he knew that or not, but this, things have changed now. He's not planting new churches. 
He's, he'll strengthen the ones he's already established, but he's heading toward Jerusalem. He's turned a corner and now set on following the course. And here we see him on the way. We see here in Acts 20, four things that he needs and that we need as we're on the way. Four things. First, we need companionship, then signs, then purpose, and then finally the final destination. First, we need companionship. After the riot in Ephesus, Paul summons the Christians there and says, you know, farewell. Uh, these will be his last words to the church in Ephesus, which he planted. He spent three years there, nurturing it, growing it. Parting is such sweet sorrow, Shakespeare said. We have a tradition here among us that when people are going on their way somewhere else, when they're moving out of the area, that we send them off with a blessing and a prayer and, and allow them to have a few last words uh, to us. You know, it's sad to occasionally have to say goodbye to people, but I, I think one of the most moving, pathetic, we don't even have a good word for it anymore because the word pathetic has been ruined. But the word pathetic originally meant, it's an old word meaning to, to be full of pathos, be full of feeling. Uh, one of the most moving, pathetic departures I've ever seen, you know, the goodbyes, uh, was when we were moving back to the U.S. from Singapore in 2002. But uh, Mary's mother had been living with us and helped raise the boys. And even though Joshua was only four years old at the time, he must have sensed how, how big a, a change, a ripping apart that this move would be from his grandmother. And so one last time is we're getting out into a car to take us to the airport and she's going elsewhere. She's going She's not going in the car with us. He, Joshua flung out his hands, four -year -old, little four-year-old boy, and ran toward his grandmother, uh, crying out, Papa! Chinese nickname for grandmother. This chapter is dominated by Paul giving his last words to the churches that he's seeing for the last time. Uh, he, and, and as he goes on his way to his destination, he's parting with them. It's the sweet sorrow. Every one of these farewells was emotional. There's, there's tears streaming, it's sorrowful, it's lingering, it's final words and hugs and walks to the ship that will carry him to the next place. Slow walks to remember. For Paul, they, they were emotional because his churches weren't just you know, preaching centers, kind of religious businesses, as impersonal as theaters. You know, it wasn't though people in the church that, do you want to go see a play? Or do you want to go hear that Jewish guy preach? No, I, you know, I've been to a fair number of of movies at the Danville Theater, but if I ever have to move away from here, I doubt I'll feel a sentimental attachment to the theater. Oh, I'll go say farewell to the people behind giving the popcorn. No, I don't think so. Hopefully, though, there will be people, people in the church in particular, that I feel attached to and, hard, and find hard uh, to leave. This is a farewell tour. And he's seeing not just religious businesses that he set up, but churches, which, is, which means assemblies, gatherings of people, people he's attached to, like they're parts of a body together, friends. And he's making this, this tour with a group, of, a group of friends, companions. There are nine companions listed in verses four to six. There's eight names, including his uh, young disciple, Timothy. And the ninth is, did you notice in verse six? And the unnamed, but once again present, traveling companion, Luke, the doctor, the writer of this book. He's obviously now joined Paul because now it's no longer they went here or there, but we, you need a we. That's what churches are supposed to be. A we, traveling companions on your journey to keep you on course. That's what church membership is, is your commitment to, to this us. That's why it's important. It's a commitment to walk or run together in Christian love, to stay on course with the rest of the pack. The most important thing really isn't that you sign your name to a commitment, but that you have that commitment in your heart to, to stay with this group of people because you need companions. You need a we that you're traveling with. Well, second, there are signs. They're back at Troas where they picked up Luke. And Paul will give his last words to the church there. When people are giving their last words, they're going to try to make them count. Usually meaningful words. You know, the last meaningful things you have to say. Beethoven's last words are supposed to have been, friends, applaud. The comedy is over. Marie Antoinette's last words as she stood before the guillotine. 
was, pardon me, sir, I meant not to do it. And she accidentally stepped on the executioner's foot. Speaking of execution, a man named James Donald French, Mr. French, about to be executed in Oklahoma's electric chair, called out to the press there. Hey, fellas, how about this for a headline for tomorrow's paper? French fries. Oh, that's bad, isn't it? That's gross. That's horrible. Paul's last words before uh, continuing on his way, leaving his friends behind, though, are more meaningful than that. At Troas, as, he, as they are gathered together in a third floor room to eat, uh, Paul started to talk with them on a Sunday night, which is the first day of the week, so that's a Sunday night. He, notice he started in the evening sometime. He's in the Greek word there, dialoguing. We talked about that last week. Dialoguing with them, the same word used again in verse 7. That means like lecturing, answering questions, probably interactive, engaging them. He continued to talk on and on. The room was full of, it says, full of these oil lamps that fill the room with fumes. So it makes, it, he makes people even drowsier as they're sitting there listening to him. But these were his last words. So they let him go on and on. No one wants to tell him, you know, that's too much. We've had enough. A young man, Eutychus, probably in his early teens, a boy was sitting on the windowsill, probably, probably sitting there for the fresh air from all, from all the fumes, but he's not as disciplined as the adults. He lets himself fall into a complete sleep and fell out of the window to the ground from the third floor. Now, some question whether he was really killed by the fall, maybe just knocked out, but Luke says in verse 9 that he was dead, and he is, after all, a doctor. Paul went down and sc scooped him up and proclaimed, Don't be alarmed. His life is still in him. When it was all over, they took him away, alive and well. It was a sign of the Lord's blessing on Paul's mission, on his, this farewell tour. Uh, it was a time for life, not a time for death. For the second time in Acts, someone is raised from the dead, resuscitated. The signs show God's blessing, that the kingdom of God is advancing. That even if it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God, the signs show us the signs, like on a race course, turn here, go this way, that we're still on track, that we're still going the way God has laid out for us to go. I'm glad we've had some signs at key points uh, in the life of this church. From the very first, literally from the very first, when the, when the vote had been to stay or to go, and then I opened my sermon notes for the very first sermon and find that several years before I had given it the title, Stay. Or like when we were considering buying this building and $1,200 of monthly support was withdrawn from us if, if we do buy this building, only to get a gift out of the blue that very same day by someone who knew nothing about what was going on for, guess how much? $1,200. Or most recently when I, last year, when coolly, rationally concluded that just, you know, I'm not sure, I don't think Covenant's going to make it. On a Sunday morning before church. Only for that to be the day that two people came introducing themselves. Hi, my name is Robert. This is my wife, Rachel. And she volunteered to help with the music on the way out. Those are signs, I think even today, that Herbie is here. Help us with the music when uh, Rachel can make it. It's, it's, these are signs that, that God is with us on this way. That we're still on course. That doesn't mean we'll be spared from all suffering or going through difficult times. But sometimes he gives signs that he's with us, even through those times. Here, they were, it says, they were not a little comforted by the sign of the raising of Eutychus. Imagine if he had left dead. I mean, th think of that. You would have your memory of the Paul, the Paul saying farewell would be, that boy Eutychus got killed that day too. So that would be sad. But that, God didn't want that to happen, so he gave a sign. No, the day, Paul, last day, Paul's day, last day was the day Eutychus was raised from the dead. That's a sign. They were not a little comforted by that sign. We're also comforted when God gives us signs that we're on course. The time will come sooner or later when I will need to be saying my last words as the pastor here. Uh, that maybe that is time for me to step aside. The main sign I would hope would be that we see the Lord provide another band to pastor uh, this church. We are, I, we can, we can, I guess I could try to hide from that sign as a way to hold on to the status quo, to avoid the future, kind of linger to where we are, to avoid the sweet sorrow. But I think we should be open to, to it whenever the sign might come. The third, on the way, you need purpose. From verses 13 to 16, we see that Paul has a purpose. 
He no longer appears to be wandering. He's focused and he's intent. In verse 13, he decides to hike rather than take the ship because it's faster for him. He doesn't want to, he wasn't want the leisurely cruise. He's in a hurry now. And when he finally boards the ship, we're given just a list of places, just place names that he visited in verses 14 and 15 quickly, one after another, just going right through them. He's in such a hurry. He's not going to visit Ephesus again. He just knows too many people there and he knows them too well. Ever, have you ever purposely not visited someone or not gone someplace where you might run into some people because you know you'll have to talk to them? Not because you don't like them, but because you do. And you know you just can't duck in and say hi and, and bye. I think we're missing a couple that, today for, the, for a similar reason. They just don't want to engage the people. They, they, they like us, but it's, now it's not when they feel like talking. And Paul is in a similar situation here. He doesn't have the time. I think that's why many of us like texting over calling. You know, if, if you call... You usually have to do at least a little small talk. You say, hi, and, you know, how's it going? And if you text, though, you can just make one quick point. You know, please change the light or something like that, <laughs> whatever. Uh, Paul was in too much of a hurry to go to Ephesus because he has a purpose. He has a, has a mission, specifically to be at Jerusalem by Pentecost. And Jesus, part two, the book of Acts, has a mission for him through Jerusalem, getting to the ends of the earth. Do you know what your purpose is? Your mission does it drive you? Does it urge you on? Sometimes make you in a hurry. It should be, it must be if it's from God, somehow related to fulfilling the mission the Lord Jesus gave us to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Fourth, and finally, what we need as we're on our way is the destination. We see that in his speech to the Ephesian elders. Now there's an enormous amount packed into this speech, which is basically the second half of the chapter. His last words to the church in Ephesus in verses 18 to 35, more than I can sufficiently handle in one sermon, but I hope to be able to revisit this passage in, in January as we look at expository preaching. Here, we see that even though Paul is on his way to Jerusalem and he's too much, too much in a hurry to visit Ephesus, just too many people he would have to talk to, it is still important for him to give that church a farewell address. So he has the elders come to him. The elders of the church gather to him in Miletus, where here we see in, in the only speech in Acts that's given to Christians. And we see Paul's last words to a church in five parts. Right? I'll break it down. First, his example. Second, his message. Third, his, his, his present. Fourth, their future. And finally, his parting instructions. First, his example. He says, you yourselves know, in verse 18, how I lived among you. His life was an example to them. First, he was an example of humility. He wasn't among them as a, 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 another traveling speaker showing off his brilliance, trying to wow them with his eloquence so that they would be overwhelmed just by how great he was. He says, no, you yourselves know how I lived among you in all humility. He was humble. But he said, you yourselves know how I lived among you serving the Lord in all humility. Some people think humil humble people got to serve me. He says, no, he was serving the Lord with humility. Not just you, Ephesians, doing for you what you wanted, was serving the Lord among you. Second, he was an example of caring, of sympathy, of weeping with those who weep. You yourselves know how I lived with tears. He cried for his people. When they suffered deaths in the family, he suffered too. When he rebuked them for their sin, he, he did it with tears, with, with anguish of heart. When he warned them about false teachers who were enemies of the cross of Christ, he did so with tears. This wasn't a, a cool, impersonal, professional relationship as though he gives them the, the truth in kind of a, a take it or leave it way. And then when the work day is over, he forgets about it because this is his work, right? So you go home and watch TV. Who cares? It's out of sight, out of mind. No, their, their, their trials, their temptations kept him up at night. They made him cry. He was also an example of suffering. You yourselves know how I lived with trials that happened to me through the plots of the enemies of the gospel. 
in his day, Jews, but in our day, maybe different enemies. Today, cults are enemies of the gospel, like what I debated last May. Now, but thankfully, they don't have the power to effectively persecute us. I'm not, I'm not afraid what the Church of Christ people are going to try to shut us down. They don't have the power. But now the culture is being swept by the idea that anyone who says what they regard as, quote, hate speech, uh, like that something is immoral or something is perverse, well, they should be silenced for that. Social media already implements this, you understand. These, some companies, some social media companies, if you say what they, don't, what they don't agree with, they will shut you down. Now, soon those people, the same, very same people, because that's what they think is the, the right way to behave, they're going to try to get the government to do the same, because they think it's right. The gates of hell are plotting to silence the church. We may have to go through suffering on our way. Then there's Paul's message. In verse 20, they know that he did not shrink from declaring anything that was profitable. He, he gave them everything they needed. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't hesitate. You know, I did not shrink. He didn't, he didn't hesitate to give them everything. This is so important to Paul that he says it again in verse 27 using the same word. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Everything that God has revealed, all of Scripture, what we call the Old Testament, He taught them. That's why we have, that's why we, here we practice expository preaching. And we'll talk about more about that in January probably. Expository preaching means going through whole books of the Bible, taking the pas a passage of Scripture, again, the, what's the main point of that passage, the main point of the sermon. We, that means we end up often going through passages that other people would think, what do you preach from here? Are, just, are difficult or controversial. We're not skipping around just favorite passages here and there. Not cutting and pasting parts of the Bible that we like together, kind of ignoring the rest. We want to get the whole counsel of God because all of it is profitable. He did it in public and private back in verse 20. You know, he did it in their big open meetings and when he visited them at home. He testifies to all kinds of people in verse 21. Says to Gentiles and Jews and all kinds of people of repentance toward God. In other words, turn from your sin and turn toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus. In other words, believe in Jesus and believe the same message that Jesus taught. Jesus came teaching about the kingdom of God. Notice that in verse 25, Paul says that he came proclaiming the kingdom. That the kingdom of God has come with Jesus. That he's risen from the dead. And so now all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. That he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. That's his message. The whole word of God. Because all of it is about Jesus. The king of the kingdom of God. That's his past with them. He invested three years with them. Teaching night and day about Jesus from all of the Bible. Now as his last words to them, he's concerned for the present, now, in verse 22, he says he's constrained, he's compelled, as if he were bound with ropes and being dragged along by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. All the while, the Holy Spirit was, was warning him at every stop along the way, probably through companions prophesying that in, it says imprisonment and afflictions await him. That's the situation he's in right now. As he gives his last words to the leaders of the Ephesian church. Now, people were saying, he'd come to every, every one of these cities he went to, they're, they're listed there. Here at Ephesus, well, he's not at Ephesus, it's Miletus. You know, they were saying to him, inspired by the Holy Spirit, if you go to Jerusalem, you'll be put in prison. Well, then why would he willingly go? You know, why not resist that compulsion? Why not flee in the other direction? You know, kind of like Jonah. Because, in verse 24... Here's one of the great mission statements of the Bible. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. One of the great mission statements in all of Scripture. Why does he knowingly go toward a destination that will result in prison and suffering? Because I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. It's not that he didn't care about himself. As if he were some kind of, you know, just a masochist, suicidal. That's not it. But, he says, if only, he doesn't count his life as any value or as precious to myself. If only, he doesn't count his life as valuable. If it will interfere 
that caring for his life, if it will interfere with staying on course, with finishing the journey that he's began. If you want to be a great athlete, a scholar, or business person, or whatever you want to be excellent at, if that's your, your quest, your, your destination that you're trying to get to, then you will not care. You won't really care about the comforts that you have to give up along the way to get there. You won't count as, as valuable or as precious to yourself. The warm bed you had to leave to get up early and go run 10 miles in the freezing weather. Or the late nights that you had to stay up reading books to, to get that degree. Or the, the long hours you had to put in at the shop serving one last customer. You are so drawn to that destination, to that goal. You don't count as precious what you have to give up to get it. The, the temporary sacrifices you have to go through don't deter you from your goal. So you stay on course. It's that goal that, that drives you. For, for Paul here, that destination isn't, of course, it's not winning the Olympics or getting a Nobel Prize or making millions. It's finishing the course that the Lord Jesus has laid out for him. Here it's the same course as Jesus ran himself. Going to Jerusalem, knowing that he will suffer there. I do not account my life as precious to myself if only I can finish my course. That course for him was the ministry that the Lord Jesus gave him to do, to testify about the gospel, the good news of the grace of God. It's now the ministry that the church has to do, that we have to, corporately, are called to do. We're called, most of all, to, to care, not about our comfort, you know, about traveling first class, about having a very nice, traditional, respectable building, any of that, but, but staying on course to all kinds of people in his present then and ours now, the vision of our future destination drives us to stay on course. And now, again, this is the situation he's in now in verse 25. Behold, I was pay attention to this. Ephesian elders, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. These are his parting words to them. Therefore, in verse 26, because of that, because he's not, he's not going to see them again, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. Because, and this is the reason that he's innocent of their judgment, if they are judged, now, if they're judged and they're found guilty of, of some sin that they'll be punished for, he, Paul is innocent of that because, in verse 27, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. He didn't hold anything back. So if they fall into sin or they have some false doctrine, it's not because Paul didn't warn them. His image here is of a, of a watchman on a city wall. In those days, you know, wall, cities had walls. They put watchmen on it. Uh, and this image is used in the, in the book of Ezekiel. The prophets are like watchmen. They're to hear the word of God. And when they hear it, they're to warn the people. Just like the watchman, if he sees danger coming, is to warn the people. Now, the watchmen on the city are only responsible to warn the people if an enemy is coming. They're only responsible to warn them. If they see the enemy and they, if they raise the alarm, they, they tell the city, hey, there's, we're be, about to be attacked. But the people don't prepare. If they don't close the gate and defend themselves, well, that's not the watchman's fault. He, he did his duty. He warned ahead of time. But if the watchman sees the coming attack and he fails to warn the people, maybe his sympathies are with the other side. Maybe he's a traitor. Maybe he's been bribed. Maybe he just doesn't, you know, wants to be popular and he doesn't want to, to be the bearer of bad news. He doesn't want to you know, go around telling people this enemy is coming. They don't want like that. If that's what he does, he will be held responsible for the warning that he failed to give. So, too, if, if we hold something back, if it's, if it's just so unpopular, maybe talk about hell, or that some things in the Bible, that, what the Bible calls sins, are really sins, like breaking your commitments, we hold back 
because people can't stand that anymore. Whether, so the result is when they are judged for their sin, when they don't repent, because they never heard that there was a hell, no one told them, then we will be held at least partly responsible because we didn't warn them. Here, Paul says that he warned them. He told them everything that God's word says. So he can lead them. He can go on his way. Innocent. Are we innocent? As we go on our way? Now, for the future, for their future. Verse 28 it is their future. He's concerned about as he's, as he's, he's about to go on his way. Pay careful attention to yourselves. To your own life. Ephesian elders. To, 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 to whether you know and live by the whole counsel of God, pay careful attention to the flock, to all the flock, the church, pay attention to it. Think about it, consider it, cry over it. The Holy Spirit has made them overseers. Uh, the, the same, the, the same different word, but the same position is the elders and they are to pastor or to shepherd it's the word there translated is, is to care for in the ESV. They are to care for, pastor, shepherd, the church of God. Now, here's all three terms, by the way, uh, for the leaders of the church in this passage. They're elders, they're overseers, and shepherds, pastors. They're the same group of people. It's different, different words for the same office. They are to care for the church because God purchased it with his own blood. In verse 28, Jesus was God's own and is God himself. God bought the church, the particular people whom he chose with his own blood. And so we should be sacrificing for it too. For their future, they need to pay attention to the church. Because in verse 29, Paul knows that after he leaves, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And, second problem, from among your own selves, in other words, from within, the church itself, not just outsiders, will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. So be alert. False teachers will come. That's what the future holds. Know who they are. For, for three years, he warned them with everything the Bible teaches, night and day, with tears, so that they would know that they would know the wolves from the sheep. They would know truth from error so that they would be able to protect the flock. Now he has to go on his way, leaving them without himself, the apostle, to guide them. Sometimes we have people in our life that we think that there, there's no way we can go on without them. We just totally depend on them, we think. But we might have to. We have to be ready to go on our way without our former companions. How will they survive without the apostle? Now, one last instruction in verse 32. Now I commend you, I was hand you over to be, to someone who's trustworthy. Now I commend you to God. God will take care of you. I commend you to the word of his grace. The word of God is what God will use to protect his flock. Stay close to it, uh, absorbed in it, attentive to it, to the word of God. It is the word, he, call, he calls it the word of his grace. In other words, not only is it about God's grace, through it we experience God's grace. It is able to build you up, to make you strong, so that you're not easy pickings for the wolves. It is able to give you the inheritance uh, that, that the Father has for you. The, the Father has an inheritance for his children, sanctification, growing to be like Jesus and close to the Father, and eventual glorification, you know, the resurrection. We, we get this inheritance, we get this new life among, notice that, among are the together with all those who are sanctified. Sanctified means set apart, set apart by the Father from the world for the purpose of getting this inheritance. Being the Father's children, being glorified, being resurrected. We get it with our companions, that is, to, together, um, among them, that is the church. That's our final destination. 
That's what drives us. We might think, well, we're, we're promised that, right? Well, that's the, the, the P in tulip, perseverance of the saints. We're going to make it even if we don't try, right? We can just relax and, and wander around. We can be assured. Well, we are promised it if you're sanctified, but it comes through the word of God. So I commend it to you. His final instructions, stay in the word. He didn't use teaching the word as an excuse to make money, to get people silver or gold or fine clothes or free Chinese food. They know that he would rather work to support himself than, than give the critics or, or the weak. He calls them here, just, just weak people, even among the church, and give them an excuse to reject the word. Help the weak by not taking full advantage of your rights. But remember, teach them to grow beyond their weaknesses, their self-centeredness, uh, their, their being cynical, they're thinking everyone is in, just in it for the money. Teach them to grow beyond that as they go on their way. Teach them to become givers. Remember what Jesus has said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Those are Paul's last words to them. And he knelt and prayed for them. They embraced and kissed him and most sorrowful because he told them that they would not see his face again. They were pathetic, filled with pathos, with feeling, with a sweet sorrow of a dear friend who is having to go one way while you're having to go another. As they took that slow walk to the ship, a walk to remember. We're all on our way. Life is a journey, and journeys are about direction. Our journeys might look different, but in the end, those who are sanctified are going to the same place. They're set apart for that place, that great destination. We might be tempted to delay, to linger at some places, with some people, with companions, to, to cling to them. That's understandable. But let's have such a vision of the destination that we don't count temporary losses along the way as too much to deter us. That we stay on course. We stay with the word of his grace. And we stay on the way.